We want to study the interaction of people and plants in the past. Their very survival depends on it, on, on the environment. It's pretty important stuff. But you know, we don't know that much about it. So it's early May, the semester's ending, the weather's turning really nice, and typically this time of year, my colleagues and I are all getting ready to go back out for our next big excavation season in Pondo Land. But this year is unlike any others, and just like millions of people worldwide, we're all sheltering in place. As a result, we've actually had to cancel our field season this year. Now, Fortunately, just the other day, I was able to get out to a local plant nursery where I found this dude. Do you recognize it? It's a common landscaping shrub here in the United States and many other places around the world. But this plant is actually indigenous to KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape provinces of South Africa. In Latin, its name is Carissa macrocarpa. But in South Africa, you may know it as numnum in Afrikaans, or umtum gulu in Isignosa. The berries have this really great sour sweet taste to them. Now, many people make jellies and jams out of them, but I like to eat them raw. And as we're going to and from site every day, I'm just constantly snacking on these things. But what really makes this plant special is it's really high in vitamin C and many other macronutrients. It's really important for archeologists to know what kind of plants grew in an area in the past, because plants like this one, not only would have provided food, but also materials for resins and glues, medicines, and anything else that a hunter-gatherer would need in the past to survive. So while I sit here and wait for my little piece of Pondoland to produce more fruit, I thought it'd be a fun idea to call up our P5 archaeobotanists and ask them how they reconstruct past environments and people's use of plants in the past. Archaeobotany is the science of understanding what vegetation grew in an area in the past, how it changed over time, and how people used those plant resources. It's a very diverse field of study, and under the coordination of our project co-director, Dr. René Esteban, P5 has brought together scientists from around the world and from many different disciplines to reconstruct the ancient world around our site at Waterfall Bluff and the lives of the people who lived there. Joining me from South Africa is our plant pollen specialist, Frank Newman, and our charcoal specialist, Allison House, as well as Irene, who specializes in plant phytoliths. Our plant wax geochemist, Anno Shevitz, is joining in from Germany, while our plant starch specialist, Cynthia Larby, is calling in from the UK. I'm so happy that you all were able to join me here today. And I was hoping that I would be able to talk to you about your experiences studying archaeobotany out in Pondo land with us, and particularly the specialties that each of you focus on. Uh, what do we do when we study botanical remains from archaeological sites is we go uh, to the site and we, uh, as we are digging, we are collecting all those uh, botanical remains that we can see. And the Pondolan is especially interesting and waterfall bluff uh, because we have very good preservation of macrobotanics. And we've been finding very exciting things. We have preserved uh, micro uh, plant remains such as pollen that Frank is studying, phytoliths. Uh, we are also find we have a lot of leaf waxes preserved that doesn't happen all so often in archaeological sites, and this is what Eno is studying. Uh, but also we have very good preservation of charcoal and uh, of macrobotanicals like entire leaves. And this is something that doesn't happen very often anywhere. The more pieces of the puzzle you have, the clearer the picture you get and the more information you've got. In many cases, you could pick up a handful of dirt and in any one of those handfuls of dirt, there's an amazing archive of the past. 
that is still preserved in there. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. So we yeah. can study plants in archaeological sites where no other type of plant remains are preserved. Sometimes the only uh, preserved remains are phytoliths, because phytoliths are micromineral remains uh, that are form of silica, so they are inorganic. So they can be preserved in ways that other organical remains don't. So um, one thing which you always have to understand is, for example, pH value. So some of your um, so-called proxies, which means all the different little objects we are studying in the soil, might be preserved better under a high pH or under a low pH. Others, like pollen, are very easily uh, destroyed by oxygen that will not affect your phytolites, which are silicates. Yeah, but if you destroy the silicates, you will destroy your phytolites. So for every single of this proxy, you have different uh, ideal um, preservation conditions in your soil and different ways of, of isolating them from the surrounding sediment. So that is what you have to keep and in mind. And that is why waterfall bluff is so important, Eric, and, uh, and why all these different uh, plant remains that we are finding in waterfall bluff are amazing because we can see all different sort of plants that are not uh, preserved or, um, or represented with one discipline, with one proxy, but you find it hmm. with another. Yeah, right. palynology is actually um, derived from the Greek word. It means the study of dust. Yeah, so you're actually dealing with very small microfossils, and all what they have in common is that they have an organic wall and they can't be destroyed by very strong acids. Next to pollen, we also uh, study, for example, the spores of ferns, but we also study fungal remains. Yeah, so from all of that, um, we derive some information which tells us something about the ecosystem, especially the plants, the fungi, also the algae, which can grow, for example, in a lake or in the soil. The leaf waxes are a scale smaller than the pollen, right? So they are molecular fossils, so molecules. So all the terrestrial plants produce these leaf waxes to protect their leaves from any like physical abrasion or bacterial or fungal attack and also to regulate their water balance. And these waxy substances, they are made to persist. So they can survive for a very long time in the sediment. And the abundance itself is very high in the Pondoland deposits, much higher than in usual soils. And of course, many times higher than in marine sediments or lake sediments, which already is an indication that probably the plants were actively brought into the sites and probably from the uh, direct vicinity of the shelter, not very far away. In the case of Waterfall Bluff, what we get is a mixture of the natural vegetation and the surrounding, yeah, which is where the pollen and the spores are blown into the site and embedded in the sediments and then preserved there. Um, and also human interaction. And that's very important because we are dealing here with, a, with an archaeological site where people were digging, they were processing plants and so on. We very much think that we have a very unique case here in Waterfall Bluff where um, a well-known medicinal plant, Artemisia, pollen of this plant are um, in the upper part of the profile, profile found in a, yeah, incredibly high amount and we can only explain that not by the natural vegetation in the area might be but i personally think it was more because people used this plant um, you can use it as a tea for example as a remedy as a medical remedy and um, so that is why pollen of that particular plant artemisia were ending up um, were uh, found abundantly in the sediments 
your example is very on point and current today because uh, right now a lot of researchers are also looking at possible influence of artemisia on treating um, the coronavirus. If you can tell what tree was there and if you assume that in a shelter such as Waterfall Bluff, all the carb, all the charcoal that you find within that shelter had to be brought in by humans, as you were saying, by the people who lived there. Um, first of all, you can tell a lot about what these people were selecting because they didn't just go out and get anything. They selected particular wood that they would use um, for particular purposes. The special thing about charcoal is that each particular type of wood has its own particular structure, um, you know, pattern that the cells make up to make that wood. And that helps you identify what the wood is. And even after the charcoal, the wood is burnt to charcoal, that structure is still there, um, perfectly preserved. Listening to you all, I, I'm extremely excited. I'm looking at diet, actually, and the things we ate, and, and particularly about starchy plants. And I've been looking for burned remains of roots and tubers in, in the fires that they made. And I'm also interested in, in, in looking for them, how they process that. Things like the tools that they might have used, um, we tend to lose sight of. You know, so we don't, we don't get to understand what they did with them out with or anything like that. But we do have some of the tools that they were using. We have a site north of Waterfall Bluff where we've actually found a fully preserved wooden digging stick. This wooden digging stick was found sitting on the surface of the back of one of our other caves. Those tubers that you would have uh, been studying that would have been cooked in these hearths, that's the tool that would have pulled them out of the ground. So we have this amazing catalog of evidence that's, that we're finding and now we're all pulling it together. So uh, it, it's something that really connects us with the past. Um, that's something that we can relate to, really. And that's really very exciting. You know, I, I think understanding how the things we used and touched and, uh, and used to, to, to sort of make our dinner uh, in, in the past is really exciting to find. I think now all of them, they have to come to Pondolang with us. When we can, when, when we're able to get back out there safely, we need to bring each and every one of you out there. And we need to all sit down together. And, and I really look forward to, to working with, with you all as we, we, we you know, wrap up this current phase of our research and then look to the future. You know, what we're gonna do at Waterfall Bluff and even at some of these earlier sites going back upwards of 300,000 years ago. Wow, it's exciting. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's my, my pleasure and uh, well, I know that uh, it's getting late there um, and I need to go have breakfast. So <laughs> I think we should uh, wrap it up here. And uh, again, thank you all very much. And we'll be in touch. OK, enjoyed it. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thanks all right. Much. OK, Bye -bye. guys. All right. Take care. Thanks,